The following interview was conducted with Terry Lou Thompson, Vice President uh, for Marketing and Media for Purdue University's Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, March 26, 2013 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emerita of Library Science. Good morning, Terry, and nice to meet you and have you participate in the program. Thank you, Catherine. Nice okay. to meet you. Let's get started. Uh, tell us where and when you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Okay. Uh, I was born in a little town called Carthage, Illinois, which is about four hours straight west of here. Uh, my parents are Dick and Nancy Lucy, and they're still living. They just walked the color run uh, with my husband and I this past weekend here on campus. They're in their late 70s and in great shape. Um, I have two siblings, a uh, brother, Mitch, who's an attorney for State Farm Insurance in Bloomington, Illinois, and a sister, Jill, Jill Beck, uh, who's an emergency room nurse in Columbia, Missouri. Oh, okay. What about your early years, about a grade school? How, what was that like? Well, it was pretty interesting because I grew up in a really small rural community. Uh, the town was called Basco, Illinois. I think there may be 100 people there. Uh, my parents were farmers, and uh, the school I went to, uh, I had Miss Alma uh, for my first, second, and third grade teacher, and actually all of those um, grades were in the same classroom. I had five students in my class. Uh, there were... For grades one, two, and three? Well, uh, actually, so first grade I had five, and then the second grade class had... I think 10 and maybe there were three or four in the third grade class. So Miss Alma had us in rows, so there'd be grade one, two, and three, and she might start grade one on math problems or something, and she'd give us some work to do, and then she'd go stand in front of the second grade class and teach them something else, put them to work, go to the third grade class, teach them something, and then come back to the first grade. Absolutely a, a amazing uh, lady. And then the same thing happened in fourth and fifth grade. We were in the same classroom with Mrs. Earls. Um, it was when I got glasses, I still remember, um, Mrs. Earls called my mother one night and said I had been a little ornery in class. She had asked me to read something on the calendar and I had said, what calendar? And she thought that was a little atypical for me and that's when they discovered I was nearsighted. Um, but it was actually um, in, in fifth grade then there was quite a movement. This would have been uh, late 60s and there was uh, a new superintendent brought into our school district and quite a movement to begin consolidating these small rural schools and my father decided to run for the school board as a write-in candidate because he felt like it would be wrong to shut down these small schools and if we went into this big consolidated district where I'd have a whole 63 people in my class uh, it would be a really bad thing. Uh, so Dad want, ran for the school board and actually won, uh, along with several, three or four more of his kind of crony farmers who, who held the same sort of perspective. And I, I really think it was one of the pivotal experiences in my life because my dad, once he was on the school board, uh, changed his mind. He heard uh, kind of a young superintendent and principal had been brought in and as they talked about their vision and talked about the benefit of uh, being in a larger school for the students as well as the financial benefit to the district, uh, he thought, well, you know, maybe this isn't so bad after all. Bus ride may not be the greatest thing, but it may be better in the, in the long run. So um, after that, then junior high was, was spent at this larger school. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now let's talk a little about high school, your, any of your teachers or your course of study and student organizations. Well, I was really involved. Again, it was a really small school. You know, there were about 200 or 250 in the whole high school. So I was one of those people that was in, I think, everything that it existed from, uh, you know, cheering to Girls Athletic Association to working on the yearbook to um, oh, uh, student government student probably. government right. just you know all sorts of, of organizations and really loved it the name of the high school was Warsaw High School um, in terms of teachers 
I suppose one of my English teachers, Mrs. Andrews, had the most impact on me. Um, and what I probably most enjoyed was doing research projects um, and doing speeches. I think early on I kind of fell in love with language arts and sure. public speaking and writing and that sort of thing. Good, okay. And I think you continued, uh, then you, now when you graduated from high school, did you go straight on to college? And I did. Okay. I went to Illinois State okay. University. I actually started out as a psychology major. Um, I had always been intrigued with behavior, but we didn't have any psychology class. It was such a small high school. Um, but I didn't like, I was in a large lecture hall, and I really didn't care for my first couple of courses. And at that point in time, this is 1975, um, kind of the word on the street was you needed a doctorate to be able to do anything with psychology. And I thought, gosh, I don't want to be in school for seven or eight years. And of course, I had a boyfriend, you know, at that point in time, and thought, oh, that'd just be awful to take seven years to to graduate, so I ended up switching my major to education. Okay. So. Um, what was campus like? Did you live on campus? I did live on campus. Okay. Um, you, were you in a sorority or? I was not in a sorority. Um, I worked. I worked in the cafeteria in the dish room, and then worked as an administrative assistant in the speech department. Okay. Um, I was uh, pretty active on campus, but between studies and working. And I graduated in three years, so I always took an overload every semester and worked summer schools. So oh. uh, it was a big, um, I suppose the campus was about 20,000 at that time, which is, you know, about half the size sure, of Purdue. Sure, right, yeah. okay. And then did you go on to, gra you did some graduate work. You have I a, did, I have yeah. a master's degree. Um, I started immediately after, um, but spent several years finishing my degree. I taught um, high grade school level? English, uh, primarily sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Had a couple of sessions, uh, sections of junior high students, but for the most part. This is in uh, high school? In teaching? high school, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So I would work, um, you know, during that time at going to school at There's night to time. finish the degree, yeah. Okay, alrighty. So. Now the career path prior to coming to Purdue, Tell us a little about that. Yeah, um, so I spent, uh, let's see, about five years teaching in small rural schools in central Illinois. Um, I taught in a little town called Eureka, which is the birthplace of uh, President Reagan. Mm -hmm. um, I taught for a couple years at a little town called Cerro Gordo, which means Fat Hill in Spanish, a small little town down by Decatur, Illinois. And then I taught two years at Wapella, another small school. And then I thought I just landed my dream job when I got hired by University High School, which is a laboratory school associated with Illinois State University. Uh, it's the oldest laboratory school in the country, and it was considered by far one of the best schools in Illinois. And the school um, took a lot of the professors uh, children from ISU and State Farm's corporate headquarters are in Bloomington, so a lot of the State Farm uh, employees. So a lot of really, uh, really gifted and talented students went there. So I spent uh, about eight years teaching there. I was chair of the English department and at the same time was a faculty associate for Illinois State University because the laboratory school was a part of the College of Education, so we were overseen sure. by the Dean of the College of Education. And so a big portion of our positions there was working with clinical experiences students. Um, so they weren't full-time student teachers, but they would come in for two, three, four week rotations to work on a particular uh, skill or, or area of their discipline. Mm -hmm. So I worked with a lot of student teachers um, or clinical experience as students, um, chaired the English department, um, really, really good. enjoyed that experience yeah, a lot. Good, good, yeah. exam or good yeah. experience, as you said. Yeah. And then what came next before you came to Purdue? Well, several things. Okay. <laughs> um, I got hired by um, State Farm Insurance. It was kind of in funny. Bloomington? In Bloomington, Illinois. Okay. I actually had the son of the Vice President for Public Affairs, 
Uh, the father was named Dan Duran and the son was Brian Duran. And Brian was a little peanut in class. He was extremely gifted, but he never wanted to do any of his homework. And then he wanted to cut a deal at the end of the semester that he'd do independent study or a special project or something. And I said, no, you know, and he was used to being very charming and very um, persuasive. He's actually gone on to become an attorney. I keep in, in touch with him. So those persuasive skills were honed early. Um, and his father was so impressed that I stood up to him that he called me up and wanted to meet with me and ended up offering me a job at State Farm. And I, I have to be honest, I was thinking about making a, a change, a change right. anyway. I was feeling a little um, like I was doing a lot of the same things over and over um, teaching. And I also saw a lot of my friends making a lot more money in other sectors. You know, it's the 80s, the yuppies of, of the 80s. And uh, so I joined State Farm in a, a perfect role, really. Um, I wrote outreach programs for agents to use in their communities. So little programs like uh, something called Smoke Detectives, which taught young students about fire safety. And the thinking of the corporation was they were was kind of good corporate citizenship as well as influencing children to good behavior and thinking they would take some of these messages home to their parents sure. and help them be better insurance. So I spent about 13 years at State Farm. I held um, seven or eight different jobs there. I moved around a lot. They had regional In offices. Bloomington. No, um, I actually um, moved from Bloomington to Seattle to head up uh, one of their regional offices in, in Seattle, actually DuPont, Washington, which is south of Seattle. And then I came back to Bloomington to do a lot of market research for them. And then I went out to Lincoln, Nebraska to do, um, to start a regional marketing uh, shop. And then I came back to Bloomington and held um, two or three jobs there. And then was recruited by Safeco Insurance to be their vice president mm -hmm. of marketing in Seattle. And so I went out there for a couple of years before I came to Purdue. Okay. Right. So. Now, Purdue University, you came in August of 08. Uh, some of the challenges and responsibilities and then was aligned with the strategic plan and then some of the results and things that, you, that have taken place since you've come on board. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, well, it was a new position uh, when I came. Joe Bennett was my predecessor. Joe had the title of Vice President for University Relations. And as the board built the strategic plan and Dr. Cordova built the new strategic plan, there was a feeling that we needed to be more aggressive about our messaging, particularly externally, and had decided that they wanted somebody to come in from outside the higher ed discipline and really build a marketing organization here on campus. So when I came, uh, the organization was very different than I think it is as I'm leaving. And uh, a few of the things that we've done uh, to really change the shape of that group is to do what we call brand differentiation research, which is to really figure out and articulate what is it that makes Purdue better, different, special. And that's where we landed on the tagline, what we make moves the world forward. and. Uh, really started more aggressively marketing the institution and synchronizing our messaging. Um, I, I think it's far from perfect, but we had a lot of people kind of telling their own story and they weren't sure. united as, as powerfully as they could be. Um, we also, uh, kind of one of the tenets of marketing is to understand how your customer thinks and to be able to talk to your customer and position your product in a way that is appealing to the customer. So we built a market research group to really do that and to help understand our student perspective, our alumni perspective, our, our donor perspective. So that whole strategic marketing group is something that's, that's very, very different. Another big change is our Welcome Center. Um, I was yeah. just so surprised when I walked into Northwestern 
avenue to the Visitor Information Center, and I saw that we shared the space with parking services. And as parents and their child might be coming in to get literature about the student, they might overhear a parent or a disgruntled employee complaining and fussing about a parking ticket. And I thought, this is not a great you know, first impression for people to see of the institution. Um, and also, our, just our materials and kind of our look and feel was not welcoming at all. So at that point, I really started lobbying, kind of first of all, the board and then Dr. Cordova, that we really needed to find more attractive space and certainly not share it with parking services. So um, you've probably been past the it's new really space nice, yeah. on the, it's not quite finished yet, but uh, I hope it'll be nearly done by my last day location. on April well, 19th. Well, one thing, uh, the, when you first came, there were several departments like University News Service, and wasn't there something for external relations, and so different units, and you, right. everything has all been coordinated. It, it has right. been coordinated, right. so we brought together the News Service. We used to call it um, PM, uh, PMC, Purdue right. Marketing Communications, out at South right. Campus Courts. Um, we brought that um, together. Engineering had a separate engineering communications group we pulled um, that group together. Mm -hmm. So really pulled together a, a lot of disparate groups, the community relations group, the visitor center. Right, I see. Um, but that brand strategy, that was a development for the uh, first for the university, wasn't it? The right, brand. it was, okay. it was. We'll yeah. make a comment on that. And you had the rollout in uh, October 2010. October in 2010, and the uh, first thing we did was that research that I mentioned, uh, sure. brand differentiation research. I call it better different special research, and we talked to about 5,000 prospective students, parents, legislators, funding agencies, um, alums, donors, uh, parents of prospective students, parents of existing students, to really figure out um, what is it that's special about Purdue, because so many institutions of higher learning present themselves very much in the same way. You know, we may di be divided by a sports division like we're Big Ten, or we may be um, a D1 school, or we may be a Research One school, or a member of AAU, but a lot of those labels don't speak to prospective students about what is it that really makes this place special and what's unique about um, this particular place. So we did a lot of research to uncover that, and then translated it into our brand strategy. And we like to think about Purdue as, if, if you summed it up in one word, we would use the word transformation, or we'd use the phrase the eureka moment. It's like everybody who interacts at, with Purdue feels like they are transformed by the institution in some way, whether it's a student getting a degree or a donor who wants to give money and is recalling back to everything that the place give the, gave them, uh, funding agencies who see the results of the money they give to a researcher yeah. translated into discoveries that make an impact either in the world or the marketplace. And, and then we tried to translate that into what's kind of, forgive my language, but kind of a sexy um, tagline and look and feel that would resonate with younger people. And that's where the notion of what we make moves the world forward yeah. came to be. Right, okay. And you did mention about uh, the market research and, the, and in the two units is that strategic market and research and your strategic communications. Those were unique ones that you started. Exactly, right. exactly. And really Groups. been a big help for you. What about WBAA? Do you do some market research? You have WBAA under your I do have oh. WBAA, and yes, we've done a lot of listener research to continue to really refine our offerings and uh, figure out ways to increase our membership. They continue to grow, but it's slow. Sure. Um, they're really a trusted news source within the community, and we want to keep uh, e exploiting them and, and helping them do as well as right. they can. Right, and it's the oldest one going. It is the right. oldest one, right. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we talk a little bit about some synergistic activities. That uh, Lucy Critical Thinking Award that you established at Illinois State. Oh, Can you make a comment on oh. that. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the things I was really interested in when I taught secondary, and I seem to have a knack for 
reaching some of those students who maybe weren't the A students, but they were extremely bright and for whatever reason they either weren't motivated in the classroom or they preferred to throw paper wads rather than, you know, read Chaucer. Um, and I, I had a little bit of that teenager reverence in me, I guess, and was able to say things in a, in a way that reached them. And I felt like it was important. So many of our war, awards in high school, and really in life, I think, are grounded on good behavior. And uh, although I think that's important and that decorum is, you know, is very important, I think it takes longer for some children to learn that than others, and not all of us come from a privileged background where that's modeled. So I wanted to set up an award that acknowledged um, that critical thinking capability, that ability to ask questions even if it's in an irreverent way in the classroom and to, to, to think and not just take an answer at, at face value. Sometimes I think in our educational system we reward good behavior more than we should and it scares me as I look back and study the Nazis and I study some other things that have happened, I see how easy it is for people to com become complicit and compliant and not always question those who are in mm -hmm. authority. And, and again, I think respect is important, but I think there's got to be a place for asking that why question. Sure. And why should I believe that? Why should I agree with it? Why does the textbook say to it that way? To help your analysis and analytics. Exactly, exactly. So um, I started the award about a year after I left State Farm in 1995, and uh, it's still being given out uh, today. And I try to go back. Uh, it's awarded at University High School to a senior who's demonstrated critical thinking. And in the award criteria, it very specifically says that GPA does not matter um, and that uh, the nominator needs to cite some very specific examples about how has the student demonstrated a questioning spirit in the classroom. Uh, I try to go back and, and give the reward myself or the award. It's, kind of one of the highlights of my year oh, when yeah. I'm able it's to really, go back. It's, and it's very nice. Yeah, yeah. A <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, couple other things that um, you're the author of Tuning Into Mom. Yeah. Uh, and uh, are you um, going to update that or to keep it as is, uh, the book? Well, I hope it gets updated. Okay. Um, Purdue Press published it, released it in 2011, uh -huh. late 2011. And we're hoping in the next year or so to do an updated version and kind of refresh our research and our case studies. Sure. Okay. Um, this um, you're the executive sponsor for Entre Nous, a student organization. Entre Nous. Uh huh. You make a comment on that. Yeah, it's really that's an interesting group. Um, that's not terribly active on campus right now, um, but a, a couple of young girls that approached me two or three years ago. And they had this idea for an organization that would focus on women in leadership, uh, but also they kind of wanted to model it after Coco Chanel. So they wanted leadership, but they wanted a lot of uh, fashion uh, involved in the organization as well. So uh, <laughs> um, I, I got involved in helping them get the organization started. Is it still functioning? It's still functioning I didn't, here. I, that but, was one name I had not uh, heard before. Yeah, they had hoped to take it uh, nationwide, but I don't think they quite have the momentum to be ready to do that <laughs> It's yet. in the planning stages, It's in right? the planning stages, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk a little bit about family. Mm-hmm. Um, Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'm married. Uh, my husband, Lyle, uh, was an actuary at State Farm Insurance and very involved in the life insurance uh, company. Well, actually, a health insurance company, I should say. He did a lot of work on their long-term care insurance policy. And he left State Farm when we went to Safeco to really follow my career. It's interesting, there's an article in the paper today about the number of women in the country who are kind of the primary breadwinners in the household, so uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, we have two boys, um, Jake and Alex. Um, Jake will be graduating from Columbia, Missouri, uh, Mizzou. Uh, he's an advertising and marketing major. 
Uh, he's supposed to graduate May 17th. He's been on the five-year plan, so we're, <laughs> we're really excited. Good. And then um, Alex uh, graduated a few years ago, and he works as a manager for Enterprise Car Insurance in St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, okay. And he's married. Uh, his wife is Kristen, is a second grade uh, elementary school teacher. Oh, so. that's great. That's very good. Yeah. Were, were you a faculty fellow while you were here, Terry, at all? In any no, way? I okay. was not. Okay. Uh -uh. I know we, I did mention uh, in the preliminary about some awards, that, but I do want to mention a few if that's okay. okay. You, I okay. think that uh, American Marketing Association, the 2012 Higher Education Marketer, that's very nice. Yeah. How did you happen to hear, did, did you have any advanced thing or was it a surprise? I sometimes ask people that, you know. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a, a total surprise, but not the day I received it. So I got advance notice. Um, I received the award in November at the annual AMA Higher Education Conference, um, but I got news about a month before that I would be named because they wanted some remarks and photos and okay. that sort of thing. So it wasn't a surprise that day, but when I got notified, I was I was very, very surprised and very, very flattered. That's very yeah. nice. And you also got the, um, uh, in 2011, the AA Lifetime American Advertising Foundation Achievement Award. You could tell us a little about the type, that type is. Yeah, award. now that was really a surprise, and that was given out at the annual dinner, which is held every February, where they give out all their, they're called Addies, so the Advertising Association Awards for you know, best TV commercial, best book cover, yada, yada, yada. And so I had gotten a call to be sure, I don't always go to the dinner, but my staff always goes, and that we really wanted to be sure Terry was at the dinner. Well, my the girl who had designed my book cover uh, was up for an Addy for the book cover, and I thought, well, they just, Carol was gonna win, and they wanted to be sure that I was there to see sure. Carol win for the design. So I went, and they're going along, and all of a sudden they call my name, and I was really quite blindsided, and anything that's called a Lifetime Achievement Award <laughs> makes one feel like <laughs> I, had, I hear you. I'm not really that old. <laughs> What's next, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Oh, um, let's see, and you got the, that uh, American Marketing Association in the Marketing News Best in Class series, there was an article in there, that's very nice. And I think also we should mention that your marketing and media unit have won several awards too. Yes. Uh, such as the at the 28th uh, Annual Higher Education Advertising, they got a gold award for the Indiana State Fair ad in the newspaper. Right, right. Very nice. Thank you, they've done extremely well in a number of areas, uh, CASE, the Advancement Organization, the AMA, the Advertising Association, the higher ed, yeah. they, they've done very, very, very well. Very nice. Yeah. And you've been pretty active in um, your professional associations, including the Economic Club of Chicago, along with the American Marketing Association. Exactly, exactly. And keep up with those. How about some hobbies, especially? In yeah, um, I love to be outside. It's probably my farm background, but I love to garden and uh, I'm looking forward to learning a whole new genre of plants as I go to the Southwest because I love hostas and roses are kind of my two favorites here and neither one of which do very well in, in, <laughs> in sand. Um, I'm a runner, although I haven't been doing much of it the last few months, but I ran a couple of marathons early in my life and used to do did a you lot want of- any of the Purdue marathons at all or the 5K? I've never done the Purdue marathons, but I just did the 5K last weekend, oh, the, color, okay. the color run. Okay. Yeah, and um, I enjoy sports of all kinds. Uh, watching, I like to play tennis, I like to play golf, and uh, I have to say I love shopping. <laughs> Especially for we shoes. We have a mutual interest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about, uh, your, you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Yeah. Um, you know, there are several things I enjoy. I have to say the most moving thing for me is the recitation of I Am American uh, before the football games. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just find that so touching, and uh, my husband always jokes that I'm an easy cry, <laughs> but uh, I just... I still tear I up when Roy I Johnson hear that. Roy Johnson does a very, he has oh. a good, his voice comes, resonates very well over the speaker. Yeah. yeah. 
And I think everybody really, really likes it. Others have, sa have said a similar thing. Yeah, yeah. Even new people that have not heard it, you know, they come to the game. Yeah. Any and other tradition that you think? Well, I, I love seeing the Boilermaker special and hearing the whistle, um, especially when the weather gets nice or before the first football game when you haven't heard it for a while and then it's out and to see the joy that it brings at the state fair as it's sure. driving around or, you know, as kids are encountering it for the first time. Um, and I just love watching the students at the, the games. Uh, once in a while, they let loose with something which is inappropriate. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just enjoy their enthusiasm and, and yeah, they're, they're taking, especially the paint crew, watching the paint crew. Yeah, they're taking so. it all in. Yeah. How about an uh, outstanding event? Do you have one? Yeah, you know, that's so, um, so hard. Uh, you, at, per, at Purdue? No, just any place. It doesn't have to be at Purdue. Yeah. Um, you know, I think personally, there, uh, I had a nephew who um, was touched by cancer and had leukemia as a as a child. And the day that he was declared um, cancer free, and then went on to play football for Illinois Wesleyan University, um, that's that's, that's pretty nice. pretty special. That's right. That yeah. is okay. Um, and in some closing things. One of the things that uh, I think was a good quote, is structure to succeed is based on your organization's goals and deliverables, and one Purdue. So I think um, in closing, I'm going to leave it up to you how you'd like to, any comments that you'd like to make overall. Oh, wow. Um, I, I guess one of the things that I've, uh, I, I do believe very much that you need to make sure that the people you select and the organization you set up is structured and people are selected strategically right. um, and that most people can succeed if they're put in, in the right place and they're playing a role that helps the organization move forward strategically. I've also brought a little mantra. I'm sure all my my staff jokes about it and every month when my full staff gets together if we have any new people uh, they have to recite the mantra and it's what I call the ABCs of marketing. And it stands for about the customer, A is about the customer, B is build the brand, and C is combine art and science. And so to me, part of what I helped bring to Purdue was really the insight around those three things. Let's think about from a messaging and outreach perspective, who is it that we're trying to influence? And we have to know something about them in order to do a good job talking to them and, and marketing to them. And then from a build the brand perspective, although this was a great place and was really well known as an engineering school, we didn't have that tight message around who are we as a, a brand and I think we've done a good job in, in building that and defining it. Um, and then combining art and science, I, I guess another thing I didn't mention was building a marketing dashboard, and it's included in that article that you reference. Um, to me, you can't manage what you don't measure, and if we're not measuring things, it's, it's hard for us to see the progress sure. we've made, and it's hard to make adjustments. And I think a lot of people think about marketing and communications as fluffier disciplines, and they're really not, if no. done well. And a lot of marketing should be grounded in, in science. If I'm sending out a direct mail piece and I'm not looking to see how many people respond to that and keeping track of the numbers and refining my message, I'm not doing a good job. If I say I'm building the brand, but I don't have a brand and ad tracking study in the marketplace and I don't know that I've got a lift of 4% from 2010 to 2011, how can the board or the president or anybody have confidence that the work that I'm doing and my team is doing really makes a difference. Right, is the message um, getting out and what's the, what's the, what's what's the outcome the impact? the impact? Exactly, so it is, and I've always said to my staff, it isn't just the activity, it's the results. Right. Um, so we have to make sure that we're combining that art and that creativity 
but also the science of understanding the customer and, and measuring what those results One are. One question that I want, um, did you work, do you work with, uh, your um, unit work with the regional campuses or is that separate? We do work or with do, them. Was most uh, of yours in West Lafayette? Most of it is in West Lafayette okay. and we would pull the regional marketers together about once a year and share best practices and, and information sure. and brand strategy and that sort of thing. Okay. But they did a lot, they had a lot of autonomy on their campuses. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, is there anything that I uh, forgot to ask or anything additional that you would like to make? Um, gosh, I don't, I don't know what it would be. Uh, yeah, I think and, you're looking for, and you're looking forward to the next stage. I'm looking forward to the next stage and... Um, Tell the researchers what the next stage is, if you will. <laughs> well, I'll it's be, not Wells Fargo. <laughs> it's not Wells Fargo, so I'll be yeah. um, at the University of Arizona in Tucson as their Senior Vice President for University Relations, and I'll have responsibility for a lot of things I had here as well as uh, government relations, and they have a medical school, so the all the marketing of their, their medical school and their hosp campus hospitals. So it's going to be a big challenge. I understand that there's a lot of rebuilding to be done there. There's a new president and they have a new Good. strategic plan and development, so I'll be on the ground floor in terms of helping translate good. that. Sounds very good. Yeah. Carrie, I want to thank you. I want to wish you the best of luck and I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to interview you for the program. Thank you very much. Luck. My Thank pleasure. Much. This is a great place. Thank yeah. you. <laughs>